behalf of the Coster family, I welcome you all to this funeral service, which is a testimony of God's faithfulness in the life of our brother John Coster. Since we depend on God alone, let's acknowledge that with these words, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let's sing together now the first song on your order of service, Psalm 23. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, Father of all comfort, you are great and greatly to be praised. Our praise today is tainted with tears because we miss our brother John Coster, whom you have taken to yourself. Not that we begrudge him that glory and blessedness, O Lord, not at all. In fact, we're happy for him. But the earthly relationships of blood and marriage, and above all, the bond of faith, are so strong. Someone who was here a few days ago is gone today. Father, death creates in us who are left behind feelings of helplessness and loneliness, all communication is cut off. O oh Lord God, be with the family members in the weeks and months that lie ahead. Cause them to lean upon you as their staff and support. Because it's only when we lean on you with all our weight and being that we discover to our great astonishment and delight how strong you are. Surround Durkee, her children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren with your fatherly care and love. May they derive their comfort from the Holy Gospel, which reveals that Jesus Christ has redeemed all who trust in him from bondage to death. 
Bless us, Father, now as we open Your Word. Give us everything we need to focus our attention on You. And so be strengthened in the faith, a faith which is able to glorify You even in the face of death. Hear our prayer, O God, for the sake of Your Son, who at this very moment is interceding for us at Your right hand. Amen. The scripture reading for this funeral service is Psalm 63. <clears throat> psalm 63, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Let's sing in response Psalm 79, stanza 5. <clears throat> text for the funeral address is printed in your order of service. Psalm 63, stanza 3. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Durkee, Chris and Calvin, Nancy and Gerald, Janice and Pete, Jeanette and Fred, Jay and Meta, Kelly and Gerald, Shannon and John, Dwayne and Wendy, Grandchildren, great-grandchildren, extended family, brothers and sisters in the Lord. On this day of sorrow and loss, we've come together to be comforted by the word of our God. While unbelievers try to cope with the death of a loved one by losing themselves in their daily work, by drowning their sorrows in a bottle, or by withdrawing in total denial, we struggle through this time of separation and bereavement by listening to the word of him who says, in my hand is the life of every creature. We turn to the Bible for the simple reason that there's no other lasting or reliable source of comfort. Everything else in this life is transitory and fleeting. Grass withers flowers fade, man dies. But the word of our Lord abides forever. 
as we go through the depths of sadness together, we reach out to the Scriptures because they are the self-revelation of the only true God. And that God is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is from everlasting to everlasting. And no, God didn't reveal Himself as the eternal, unchangeable One just to underscore how infinitely exalted He is above us. This Almighty God is our faithful Father through Jesus Christ. We're His children by the grace of adoption. We can pour out our hearts to Him because He's always there, ready and willing to listen. Very present help in time of trouble. This morning we're going to meditate on a portion of Psalm 63. I preached on it at another funeral many years ago where John and Durkee were in the audience. And when the service was over, they came to me and said, if one of us passes away, that's the text we want explained at our funeral. There were several reasons for that. First, because they derived comfort from it and it strengthened their faith in God. But even more importantly, they zeroed in on this text because they wanted you and me to hear its message. Funeral addresses are not for the dead, but for the living. And John was fully aware of that, having gone to many funerals during the 88 years God gave him in this veil of tears. It was his burning desire that his family and his fellow saints be instructed, guided, and consoled by this particular text. Because your love, O oh God, is better than life. My lips will praise you. What's the Holy Spirit telling us in this passage? Well, the psalm begins with a heading that says, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. He's in the wilderness because, verse 9, there are some who seek to destroy his life. And verse 11, because there are those who are liars, lying presumably about him. So the psalm looks to a particular episode in David's life. In 2 Samuel 15, Absalom, one of David's sons, set himself up at the gate of Jerusalem and spread lies about his father. Word reached the king and he fled because of the danger of being killed since Absalom had amassed an army and was marching on Jerusalem. David left the ark of God and its dwelling place behind and he escaped to the wilderness where he set up camp. Now bear in mind that David had been reigning for many years as king in Jerusalem. He had been extraordinarily blessed by God. But after the sin with Bathsheba, there had been consequences and trials. Though he was forgiven by God, though he was welcomed back into fellowship, though the joy of his salvation was restored, there were difficult tests. And this was one. He was driven from the royal city by his own son, who mimicked David's sin by committing adultery with the king's wives in the sight of all Israel. The worst for David was not that he was holed up in a hot and dusty land, or that shame had been heaped on him, or that he was chased off the throne, or that he was in danger of losing his own life. What tore his heart out was that he had been separated from the worship of God, of Israel's eternal king. That's the historical setting for David's prayer. And once again, we see God bringing the best out of David in the worst of situations. His longing in the wilderness isn't for water, but for God. Just as parched soil desperately needs rain, so David yearns for God. This is a demonstration of David's trust in God. When David says, you are my God, he's acknowledging the relationship of grace that God had established with him. 
Isn't that the great covenantal refrain that runs through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? I will be your God and you shall be my people. David's saying amen to that word of Yahweh. He's saying, I believe that and I trust in you, O Lord. I see that you are the one who gives life and sustains me and I depend on you for everything. That same promise, by the way, God signified and sealed to Brother Coster back in 1935 when his parents held him as a baby at the baptismal font. God the Father testified to him, I adopt you, John, for my child and heir. The same God, the same covenant, the same promise for David, for John, for all who believe in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that David doesn't say that he's seeking a return to the comforts of the palace or revenge on his enemies or better conditions in the wilderness. No, he says in verse 1, O God, earnestly I seek you. The King James translates early I seek you. And indeed, the root word means the dawn. So it carries the idea of something that's done first or early because it's the most important. It takes precedence over anything else. In faith, David, the fugitive king, looks back to the days when he took part in the organized communal worship of Israel where he met with God. Verse 2. I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Sanctuary refers to the place, at this point still a tent, where God symbolically dwelt among his people. Place where God had his earthly throne between the cherubim above the Ark of the Covenant. It was the place where sacrifices were offered for sins, and where the sweet-smelling incense of prayer was burned. David, as you know, brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And this was the place where, from then on, the ministry of atonement took place, where God was called upon, thanked, and praised with singing and musical instruments. When David uses the word sanctuary, it's loaded with all that meaning. Of course, God is everywhere. And David didn't have to go to the sanctuary to pray to God and be heard by him. He composed this prayer in the wilderness. But he looks back at the worship in the sanctuary as the place to be. The city chosen by God to reveal his power and glory. Brother Coster, by the grace of God, shared the same longing as David. He, too, wanted to worship God on Sundays more than anything else. It was evident in his faithful attendance right up to the last Sunday, when he was already beginning to feel sick and faint. He knew that when we're gathered together on the Lord's day to worship God, we're in the sanctuary. We're in God's holy place, not because there's anything special about this building, but because by faith in the Spirit we've ascended into heaven. That's what the author of Hebrews tells us, doesn't he? You have come to Mount Sion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all. To earnestly seek God, one thing we have to do is to attend the worship services. It's so simple and basic, yet many Christians can't be bothered with regular faithful attendance at worship. 
Once when I mentioned this in a sermon, a member said to me, Reverend, going to church twice on Sunday isn't going to save you. He was right, of course. But then going to church once on Sunday isn't going to save you either. But here's the point. If we are yearning for God, we will strive to come as often as we can because God meets us. He speaks to us in the assembly of the redeemed. Why do we go to church? Out of custom? Is it because that's the way we were brought up? Do we come strictly to obey the fourth commandment? Is it because of the beauty of the songs, the charisma of the minister, the joy of fellowship, the talent of the organist? Is it to put on a good appearance? When it comes right down to it, there's only one reason for going to church. It's the reason of the psalmist. We come to church first and foremost to be in the presence of God and His Christ. We come to church because we're seeking God. Desiring God, that has to be our motive let me illustrate that with an anecdote from the life of King Louis XIV of France. One Sunday when he and his royal party arrived at church, no one was there except Archbishop Fenelon, the court preacher. Surprised to see all the vacant seats, the king inquired, where is everybody? Why isn't anyone else present this morning? The minister answered, I announced that your majesty would not be here today because I wanted to see who came to the service just to flatter you and who came seeking God. I'd like you to consider for a moment how many different expressions David uses in this psalm to express his intense aching for God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. On my bed I remember you. I meditate on you through the watches of the night. My soul clings to you. The word clings doesn't quite catch the force of what's said. The original word has the idea of movement in it. It's not the idea of hanging on to something static and passive like a child hugging a teddy bear. It's the idea of gripping or staying close by following. Another translation renders it this way. My soul follows hard after you. You see that? We come to church because we are seeking the living God, thirsting for Him, longing for Him, remembering Him, meditating on Him, following hard after Him. David praises God because of His steadfast love, which is better than life. Your loyal love, he's saying, is so good so sweet, so full of reward and satisfaction and fulfillment that it's better than life itself. Steadfast love is a pregnant word in Hebrew. It's rich with meaning and can be translated loving kindness, forgiveness, mercy, compassion, grace. Notice how he draws conclusions about God's steadfast love from seeing his glory and power in the temple. Do you remember when Israel was encamped at Sinai and Moses asked God to show him his glory? We read in Exodus 34, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In other words, God's glory is his steadfast love. His love is displayed and it's tasted in his mercy and grace, in his slowness to anger, in his forgiveness of sins. How does David see that in the sanctuary? Because the sanctuary is a place where sin is covered. Where rebellion against God is dealt with. 
How can a God of blazing purity live in the middle of a sinful people without destroying them? Only through the ministry of the priest. Only when Aaron's sons offered animal sacrifices at the tent of meeting and later in Solomon's temple. It's as if the sin of the people is transferred to the animal and the animal is killed and consumed in their place and the Lord looks on them in favor. He shows them mercy, sparing them what they deserve, his anger and curse. He shows them grace, giving them what they don't deserve, his ongoing peace and presence. This is the power and glory David sees in the wilderness as he looks back in his mind at the sanctuary where he once worshipped. Better than being alive, and enjoying all that life has to offer is to know that God set his unfailing love upon me. A love that extends beyond the grave into eternity. If you desire God more than you desire life, then you want God before and above all the joys of this life. Family, health, food, friendship, job satisfaction, computers, music, homes, vacations, you name it. When David says that the love of God is better than life, and therefore better than all the pleasures and beauty of this life, he's not denying that all those good things come from God. He's warning us Rather, that if our hearts settle even gratefully on the gifts and do not yearn for the giver, we are idolaters. Isn't it the case, brothers and sisters, that we worship the one thing we really want? Somebody once wrote, Worship concerns whatever matters the most to you, whatever or whoever has the highest value in your life. Now, that may be a relationship or a dream, a position or status, something you own or a job or some kind of pleasure, but whatever label you give it, it's what you've concluded in your heart is the most precious to you. And what is worth most to you is what you worship. And as a result, worship fuels all our actions. It becomes the driving force of everything we do. Every person on this planet worships something. There's a multitude of people proclaiming with every breath what is worthy of their affection, their attention, their allegiance, declaring with every step what it is they worship. Some of us attend church professing to worship the living God above all. Others rarely darken the doors. And they might say that worship isn't a part of their lives because they aren't religious. But everybody has an altar, and every altar has a throne. So how do you know where and what it is you worship? It's easy. Follow the trail of your time, your desire, your energy, your money, your allegiance, and at the end of that trail, you'll find a throne. And whatever or whoever is on that throne is what you worship. And sure, not many of us walk around saying, I worship my possessions, or I worship my job, or I worship my body, or I worship me. But the trail never lies. We may say we value this or that thing more than any other, but the volume of our actions speaks louder than our words. We worship what matters most to us, and David is telling us here, the thing that matters most to me 
The thing that I want with desperate desire is God's steadfast love. You can have my kingdom. You can usurp my throne. You can take my life even. But God and His love are everything. As Asaph put it, O Lord, whom do I have in heaven but You? And on earth, nothing I desire besides You. My flesh and my heart may fail, but You, God, are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It's during the worship services on Sunday that God shows His power and glory and His steadfast love, doesn't He? He greets us with those familiar words, grace and peace to you from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. He proclaims His loving kindness to us in every single sermon. He distributes the benefits of His Son's redemptive work, the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. At the Lord's Supper, we remember the death of Christ on the cross in which God's love and mercy and grace are most clearly seen. As we eat the bread and drink the wine, our souls are being satisfied with, with fat and rich food. And our thirst for God is quenched and he, as He feeds us by faith with the body and blood of His dear Son. What David saw in the sanctuary in shadowy form, we see in HD, in high definition. What all those animal sacrifices pointed forward to and symbolized has now come. How is God's steadfast love supremely manifested in Jesus Christ? Think only of what John writes in his first letter. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. There was nothing in David or our brother Coster or any one of God's children that made him love us. He saw us already before the foundation of the world in our filth and defilement, in the enormity of our guilt and in the wretchedness of our misery. And he loved with a love so great, so invincible, so purposeful that he delivered up his own son to nothing less than the curse and wages of sin. He reckoned the son of his bosom with transgressors. He laid on him the iniquity of us all. He gave him up to taste eternal death. Why? So that all who believe in his only begotten might have everlasting life. In Christ, there is blessing and peace, joy and salvation. If David can say that the Father's love is better than life, how much more you and I, who have seen that love so poignantly and preeminently displayed on Golgotha. And now, David's reaction must also be ours. My lips will praise you. I will bless you, O Lord, as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. Since our hearts are filled with such deep longings for God, we can't keep them bottled up. We want others to hear how richly God has dealt with us. And so we talk about His wondrous deeds openly and publicly. We sing about them in our homes and in our worship services. Doesn't the Lord Jesus Himself say that what's in here will pour out over our lips? We're able to do that even at this funeral gathering, to praise God. Because we know that our brother Coster is experiencing in even fuller measure than he did on this earth, the truth of this text that God's steadfast love is better than life. 
and know his task and purpose haven't changed now that he's in heaven. Together with the angels and the departed saints, he's rejoicing in the God of his salvation, basking in his unshakable love, and looking forward to the day when he will praise God in a glorified body and enjoy him forever. Amen. Let's sing together now from that same psalm, Psalm 63, stanza 2. Let's do exactly that. Address our God in thankful prayer. Faithful Father, gracious God, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the unspeakable comfort you give us in your word. We thank you for the constancy of your love, which truly is better than life itself. Father, we have seen that love in action in how you sent your Son to suffer and die in our place. You have reminded and assured us once again that we have complete and eternal salvation in him alone. Help us now to believe in his name, to plead on his sacrifice, to obey his commandments, to hunger for his righteousness, to beg for his spirit, to promote his kingdom, and to rejoice in him always, our great God and Savior. Father, through our grief and sorrow, cause us indeed to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He is our hope and our strength and our song. We wait for him, Father, with burning hearts for the day when his glory will fill the earth, when the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, and you will be everything to everyone. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing song is hymn 64. Thank you.
like that. This feels a bit awkward, but is it still on? You can hear me? Yeah. Pull up my notes. Just wanted to say a few words on behalf of the family. Thank you for coming, particularly also knowing that some of you came from quite a distance. Some of you had to fly in, drive from a long way. We want to thank you for the blessing that you have been in mom and dad's life, and we're thankful that you will also continue to be a blessing for mom. Thank you, Reverend Ludwig, for your willingness to lead the service today, providing comfort, encouragement, admonition, as well as Kitching, Steep, and Ludwig for your care and consideration also at this time. Many questions that we had were answered with, we'll look after that, or don't worry about it, it's under control. Last night at the visitation here, we were reminded of how many people mom and dad knew, and also through 65 years of marriage, that number adds up, and we were here for quite some time. And as I stood and I saw how long some of the visitors had to wait, I realized it more and more, but I think it also had something to do with the fact that some of my siblings, and I won't mention any names, also have the gift of gab that dad had. Many a time, us kids and mom were waiting around while dad chatted with friends, neighbors, relatives, strangers, police officers. His cheerful disposition was also something that allowed him to fly under the radar, so to speak, with respect to the dementia that shackled him more and more as he aged. Any time you would walk in their condo, ask him how he was doing, the answer always was, A1, any better and I wouldn't be right. Over the years, <clears throat> he had, had always quite a repertoire of expressions that he used. And one of the expressions that he often used, particularly when we were younger, was, no rest for the wicked, and the righteous don't need any. And we can only conclude from that that he saw himself as a fallen and sinful person in need of a savior, because he certainly did work hard and enjoy working, and he also did his best to instill that in his kids. You are all now invited to stay here, join us for some fellowships, a bite to eat, a cup of coffee or a cold drink, and enjoy a time of fellowship with us. And it is also our hope and prayer that we all receive traveling mercies for our journeys home. If Dad could have the last word here today, I'm sure he would say, keep smiling, even if it hurts. Thank you. <laughs>